For this morning, we're here in Luke chapter 19. Let me give a little bit of an introduction to our study and then we'll read out of Luke 19. Uh, For the last 2,000 years of church history, today has been traditionally called Palm Sunday. And it marks the beginning of the final week of Jesus' life leading up to his crucifixion. It is called Palm Sunday because on the Sunday when Jesus entered Jerusalem, in that final week of his life before he was crucified, the Bible says that people lined the streets and welcomed him by the waving of palm branches. In fact, in John's gospel, you don't need to turn there, but in John 12, 13, he specifically talks about palm branches when he wrote this. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. And what was happening was it was basically a hero's welcome where the people were just hailing him as king, waving palm branches, rolling out the red carpet, you know, ticker tape parade, that kind of a thing, where people were just rejoicing at Jesus coming into Jerusalem, uh, their long awaited king. And they were treating him this way because he was important. Jesus was important to them so long as he did what they expected him to do. And many of you know the story that, you know, they, they, they hail him king and they, you know, were waving palm branches until such time that he doesn't do what they expected. What they expected was for him to overthrow the Roman government, for him to bring in uh, the kingdom of Israel and to usher in peace. And when he didn't do that, because his agenda is bigger than that, the hero's welcome turned into the cry of the mob to have him crucified. And just in a few short days, you know, it says a lot about the expectations of people. When Jesus doesn't come through the way we think he should come through, you know, are we still going to worship him? Are we still going to be faithful to him? And so Jesus had a different agenda. His agenda was greater. They didn't understand. His agenda was higher. He wanted to come to die for the sins of the world. The Bible tells us in John's Gospel 12, verse 16, that even his own disciples did not understand this moment when he's coming into Jerusalem. People are waving palm branches. They're they're singing unto him. They're worshiping him. Even his own disciples, John 12, 16 says, did not recognize this. They did not understand it. Only after Jesus was glorified did they understand that these things had been written about him. And it would be the lack of understanding among all the people that would, that would cause Jesus to weep. Literally, you're going to see it in our story, to weep. As he came upon Jerusalem, as he approached the Mount of Olives, for the final week of his life before he was crucified, he would weep over this city. He would specifically weep over the people of the city of Jerusalem. Because by denying Jesus, most of them just didn't accept that he was Messiah, they were denying themselves the peace that everybody wants but nobody can really have without him. And that's what causes him to weep. It's the ultimate peace that Christ came to give us, peace with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you're going to see here in this story how he weeps over the city, not for his own sake, but for the sake of all those who are going to rob themselves of the ultimate peace in knowing him. And so here in Luke chapter 19, if you have your Bibles open there, I'm going to read verses 28 to 44. Luke 19 verse 28 says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, He sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. And they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground. And by the way, it's here in John 12, 13, that John, when he records this scene, he adds, and they're waving palm branches. 
Verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So pause there. You can keep your Bibles open. We're going to be looking at this passage verse by verse today in a teaching that I've entitled Palm Sunday, Past, Present, and Future. Let's pray first. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that we can remember the joyous occasion of your entrance into Jerusalem. And yet we're, mi we're mindful of the fact that that, that joyful celebration was short-lived as people demanded your crucifixion. And still we understand that your word says it was God's will to crush the Lord and cause him to suffer because it was in your providential plan, Lord, that you should die for the sins of the world. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you had us in mind when you went to the cross because of your love for us to redeem us, to save us from sin and death, from ultimate punishment. So, Lord, we rejoice. We have the advantage of seeing this story from a different angle and knowing your purposes for which you came. And we just are grateful and thankful and we worship you in the house of the Lord today. And we say, blessed is he who came in the name of the Lord because you came for us. And we love you for that, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. We pray these things. And everybody said, amen. Well, let me start with first things first. We're going to talk about Palm Sunday past by looking together at this story in its original context. And what we have here in our story, if you have your Bible still open to the passage, is Jesus is walking up to Jerusalem, coming from east, going east to west. And uh, he's approaching the Mount of Olives, and there are two kind of twin villages that are located there just on the slope of the Mount of Olives called Bethphage and Bethany. Uh, Bethphage in Hebrew is from two words, Beit uh, Pagim, meaning house of figs. So it was a place well known for the production of figs. And the city, the village right next to it is Bethany, uh, Bethania, two Hebrew words that means uh, house of the poor. And actually, Bethany was a, a place that scholars believed literally meant poor house because if you were uh, impoverished, uh, you could live in Bethany and you would be able to live there basically in the poor house. But it was a place provided for those who were poor. And so as Jesus is approaching the Mount of Olives and Bethphage and Bethany are in the near distance, he says to two of his disciples, I want you to go ahead of me. And I want you to go to the village there, and you're going to find a colt tied there. And, and I want you to untie the colt and bring it to me so I can ride it into Jerusalem. Now, we know from the other Gospels that this colt is actually a donkey. So this is not a horse. It's not a colt like a horse. Not Colt 45, not Colt McCoy. This is colt, although we need Colt McCoy, but this is colt, a donkey colt. And so Jesus says to them, bring it to me. And, and so... He's going to ride this donkey into Jerusalem as a fulfillment, Matthew tells us in Matthew's gospel when he records the whole Palm Sunday story, as a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Now, there were more than 300 prophecies related to the first coming of Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled every single one of them because he wanted not just to fulfill the scriptures for, for fulfillment's sake, but he wanted people to understand his true identity that he was actually a fulfillment of all these prophetic passages so that they would recognize him, so that they would know him. I mean, after all, we just read at the end of this passage here in Luke 19 that this was what grieved God most, that they did not recognize the time of God's coming to them. But Matthew refers to Zechariah 9.9 when he talks about the Palm Sunday story, and he said this. He, he says, 
This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so again, this is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Matthew tells us specifically, this is the reason why Jesus wanted to ride this donkey into the city of Jerusalem. One more piece of evidence that people would look at this and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This this is bringing to mind, oh yeah, Zechariah 9.9. This must be Messiah. And so Jesus sends these two disciples on this little mission, go to the village ahead of you and, and get this colt, bring it to me. And if the owners ask you, and they will, Why are you untying and taking our colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Just say that, the Lord needs it. Now, it's easy for us sometimes to read Bible stories like this, an ancient story, an ancient text about ancient people, and think to ourselves, well, I guess that's just culturally the way they did things back then. As if to think that going into another village and untying somebody's donkey and taking it for yourself is just kind of normal. Wasn't normal. This was not more, this was very unusual what Jesus was asking them to do. Now remember, keep this in mind. Donkeys served basically two purposes back in the day. They were a beast of burden, right? They were a farm animal, useful in hauling things. They were a, a, a beast of burden. They, they were a work animal. So you used them to haul things. And they were a mode of transportation. Uh, Jesus is about to mount a donkey as a mode of transportation to go into Jerusalem. So keep those things in mind because what I'd like to do is translate this story in modern terms so you understand just how highly unusual this request was that Jesus was making of his disciples. Okay, so with that in mind, here's modern terms. Jesus is approaching Leesburg (laughs) and he's coming from the east. So he's around Cascades area, he's not very far away. And he turns to a couple of his disciples and he says, boys, listen, I need you to go up to the village that we're approaching, Ashburn Village. And I need you to go to the Ashburn Village Shopping Center. And and when you get there, you're going to find in the parking lot a beautiful, silver, shiny Ford (laughs) F-150. It's a truck. It's worth hauling things, and it's a mode of transportation. Go with me. And so he says to them, I want you to hotwire the thing hotwire it, and I want you to bring it to me. We're going to drive it the rest of the way into Leesburg. So you're one of the disciples, and you've just been told this. Your immediate reaction is, Lord, we, we, can't, we can't do this. In the first place, in the first place, we're going to get lost in Ashburn. Because it all looks the same. Everywhere you drive and every shopping center you come to all looks the same. In the second place, if we were to find this Ford F-150, nobody's going to let us just hotwire it and drive it away. And Jesus like, listen, boys, listen, when the owners of that truck ask you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs it. Everybody understand the picture now. So this is what's happening. So they go on up in the village ahead of them, and there they go, and, and they just, you know, they, they hotwire this, this donkey, and, and, and they bring it to Jesus. And the people ask, just as Jesus said that they would, the owners are going to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Driving away my car. And you're just supposed to say, the Lord needs it. And that's what they did. Now, it's interesting to me how... The Lord being God could have just decided to produce a donkey all by himself, just in the bushes. Guys, go get this donkey. It's right over there in the bushes. Or or he could have snapped his fingers and there would be a donkey on the Palm Sunday road. But what I love about this story is this reminder that God loves to employ people in the work of the kingdom. He could have just himself provided a donkey for himself. But he loves to employ you and me in the purposes of the kingdom. And so to some, like the disciples, he said, go. And to others, like the owners of the donkey, he said, give. And sometimes he says to us both. But God loves to employ people in the purposes of the kingdom. 
And so they went, as he instructed, they were confronted by the owners as they were told, they gave the response, Jesus gave them to give them, and we have no reaction given to us in the Bible from the owners. Perhaps the owners, when, when they dropped the name of Jesus, our Lord needs it, they were just like, oh, well, sure, by all means, take it. Well, we have no reaction of the owners, but all of this goes down just as Jesus said, and off they go with the donkey. Now in your Bible, it said verse 35. Look at the story again. So in verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And this is again where John 12, 13 says, and they were waving palm branches. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices, notice, for all the miracles they had seen. Okay, pause there for a moment. All the culmination of all these miracles that Jesus had performed is now just, you know, welling up within all these people. And they're just like, wow, what a miracle worker. This guy's amazing. And they're, and they're worshiping him. And they're laying down their cloaks, you know, again, like rolling out the red carpet. And they're waving palm branches. And they're, and they're treating him in, in such an honorable way. And in the Palm Sunday story recorded in John's gospel, he says that one of the miracles that they were most amazed about when John records the Palm Sunday story in John 12 is an event, a miracle that happened in the previous chapter in John 11, which was when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And in fact, when John records the Palm Sunday story in his gospel, he says that many people were coming to faith in Jesus because of Lazarus. That they, they, in part, they were so excited to welcome Jesus because they also were rejoicing about how he raised Lazarus from the dead. And in John's gospel, when John records this, he says this, He says, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. I find that to be rather rich, don't you? That, you know, here it is that the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus because they didn't believe that he was Messiah. But on top of that, they're trying to figure out how do we do this? Because Jesus is really super popular right now. And how are we going to kill him? And on top of this, we got an even bigger problem. We got we to figure out how to kill a dead man who's alive again. <laughs> and so they're not only trying to kill Jesus, they're trying to figure out a way to kill Lazarus. Well, the people are gathered along the road here, descending the Mount of Olives. By the way, when we go to Israel, those of you who've been with me, and we're going to be there in another month, we, we go down this very road, this Palm Sunday road. Imagine the scene here, people gathered, celebration, waving palm branches, rejoicing. And they say in verse 38, notice in your Bibles, they say in verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of your Bibles have a little footnote that tells us that when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they're actually quoting Psalm 118, verse 26. And Psalm 118, verse 26 was a messianic passage, meaning there are different passages in your Old Testament that specifically refer to the coming of the Messiah. And the Jewish people understood Jesus is Messiah. And so Psalm 118, 26, they quote it as they're rejoicing about him entering Jerusalem. But their understanding of what Messiah meant was not all that accurate. And in fact, the Jewish understanding of what they believed Messiah to be in the days of Jesus is not too different from how many Jews today who don't accept that Jesus is Messiah view the idea of Messiah, which is this, that Messiah is coming to bring political peace to the earth. They were looking for a political savior. They were looking for someone to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. Now, in a similar way, Many Jewish people today who don't accept that Jesus was and is Messiah are still looking for that kind of political savior. And so as they are celebrating him, they're celebrating him based on their concept of what Messiah is. He's coming to give us peace. But the truth is that Jesus' first coming was not about bringing political peace. 
In fact, Jesus even said in Matthew 10, 34 to 36, do not suppose that I have come to bring you peace, for I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And he adds, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And what Jesus was saying was that he understood he's a polarizing figure. He's a polarizing figure simply because you cannot remain neutral as to who he is. He is either, as he said he was, Savior and Lord, he's Messiah, or he's a lunatic. You can't have middle ground when it comes to Jesus. And knowing this, Jesus recognized that therefore then, you can't remain neutral on the identity of Jesus. So even within households, those who say, yes, he's Lord, he's Savior, he's Messiah, amongst those who say, no, he's not, you're gonna have division. You're gonna have conflict. Some of you understand what this is even in your own household. There are people within your own immediate family who are believers and those who are not. And, and the differences have sometimes led to great division and great consternation. And Jesus is saying this about himself. He says, I, I am who I say I am. You can't remain neutral on me. And people are going to draw lines about whether they believe I am who I say I am or whether they don't. And in drawing those lines, there's going to be division. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. The first coming of Jesus was not about political peace. It was about personal peace, personal peace. His second coming will be about bringing political peace. That is to say, when he rules and reigns and forever, we are under the rule and reign of the Prince of Peace. Then there will be world peace. His first coming was not to usher in political peace. It was to usher in personal peace. And this is the very thing that causes Jesus to weep over Jerusalem. Because as he realizes that their expectation of Messiah was one thing. We want, we want you to throw off the oppression of the Roman Empire. And we want political peace. We want peace on earth. And he came not to establish that at that time. He came to establish personal peace by dying on a cross. His agenda was higher. Was higher. His agenda was greater. His purposes were, were more perfect than what they understood. And thus when they rejected him, they rejected the peace that comes through knowing him. The personal peace. This is why Jesus weeps. But we'll get to that in a moment. First, look at verse 39. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Well, the Pharisees, you see, did not acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah. So it enraged them that he was allowing these people to ascribe messianic passages from the Bible to him. These Pharisees didn't like that the people were praising Jesus and that he was accepting it. And so they wanted him to admonish all the people and to rebuke them for praising him as they were doing. And Jesus says to them, no can do. I mean, if I, if I tell them to stop praising me, then the stones will cry out. The stones, they're gonna to start to sing. And what will the stones sing? Can't get no satisfaction. That's what they're gonna sing. Not without Jesus, can't get no satisfaction, not without Jesus. And so he says, okay, literally, all right, so I digress. But the stones, the, the rocks, creation, why? But what he's really saying is you can't muzzle creation when it comes to creator. David, when he would write Psalm 19, he would say in verses 1 and 2, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. So even creation cries out in worship of the creator. So Jesus, in effect, was saying, if I tell these people to stop, they're part of creation. Just the rest of creation, like stones and trees, everything else is going to cry out and worship to creator. And so the Pharisees take issue with all of this. The fact of the matter is what you have happening at the same time is people rejoicing and people rejecting. And that's typical of every crowd. You will have some who rejoice about Jesus and some who reject Jesus but he continues to fulfill his purposes. Look at verses 41 and 42. Here's where he weeps. 
as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Again, they were seeking political peace, freedom from Roman oppression, but there is a greater peace that he desperately wanted them to know because there is a greater oppression than the Roman government or any human government can ever impose on another living being. The greater oppression, the greatest of all oppression, is not what man can do to man, as terrible as that often is. The greatest oppression is the oppression of sin. It's being separated from God. It's not having peace with God. And what Jesus came to do was to provide for us a liberty from sin and death so that we could have a peace with God, so that we could be at peace with Him. This is what Jesus wanted to usher in, not a world peace, that'll come later, but a personal peace so that we could be right with God and have peace with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The fact of the matter is, friends, listen, the fact of the matter is you can live in the most free country and be oppressed. And likewise, you can live in the most oppressive country and be free, depending on whether or not you know Jesus. That's why Jesus said in John 8, 36, he whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. He's talking about a personal freedom, the liberty of the human soul. And this is what he wanted for them. But they rejected him. And when they rejected him, they rejected the peace that comes with him. And this is why Jesus weeps. Now, it is recorded only twice in the Bible that Jesus wept. No doubt he wept more than that, but twice it's specifically recorded. The one time Jesus wept that is most often remembered is when he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Remember that story? This is the other scene when he weeps over the city of Jerusalem. And it's interesting that when the Bible describes these two occasions of his weeping, it uses two different Greek words in the New Testament. When he wept at the tomb of Lazarus, it was a Greek word that meant the shedding of a tear. Just the shedding of a tear. Just a very quiet shedding of a tear. Because Jesus ultimately knew that Lazarus was going to rise from the dead and that Lazarus would experience eternal life on the other side of all that. And so his weeping was not, you know, all that emotional. Just the shedding of a tear. But in this scene here, where Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem, specifically the people who lived in the city of Jerusalem, it is a different Greek word that means wailing and sobbing. I want you to picture this with me. I want you to picture our Lord weeping and sobbing over lost people. Now, I don't know if people could even hear him wailing and sobbing because they're cheering at the same time. I wonder if some were confused as they're looking at him all emotional and they're waving their palm branches and rejoicing. But this is what the Bible says. He wept over Jerusalem because he is cut to the heart. He is grieved. Do you understand that God grieves even today over lost people? I want you to picture your Lord sobbing over lost souls because he realizes that the peace that they hoped for, they would never experience without him. And because they had rejected him, they had forfeited the peace that goes with knowing him. And so he's weeping over them. He's distraught over them. And sadly then, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at verses 43 and 44. He said, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus prophesies about an event that will be fulfilled 38 years after he says this. The Jewish people will start a revolt against the Roman Empire in 67 AD. And in 70 AD, the Roman Empire has enough of it. And they come in and they start slaughtering the Jewish people in Israel. And they totally destroy the temple. The Roman soldiers, historically, we know this, not from the Bible, but we know this historically. The Roman soldiers will cut down olive trees from the Mount of Olives, haul it into the Temple Mount, and light it on fire. Because the, the oil of the olive trees will serve as a flammable substance. And they will light everything on fire in the Temple Mount. 
And history says that the gold from the temple melted from the intensity of the heat and dripped down into the crevices of the stone pavement and that Roman soldiers were taking knives after it hardened and were picking out gold from the crevices of the pavement, trying to retrieve gold that had melted from the Temple Mount. Josephus, the first century historian who lived as an eyewitness of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, when Titus Vespasian comes in with the Roman army and completely destroys the city, Josephus writes in Antiquities that when that happened, 1.1 million Jews were killed and 97,000 Jews were enslaved. To this day, when you go to Israel, there are rocks from the Temple Mount that were on the top that have fallen down on the bottom of the floor, which is the pavement level where Jesus walked. They've left them there intentionally to this day as a reminder. Here's a picture of it. These stones, this rubble, is left from the first century in 70 AD when the Romans toppled the Temple Mount area. These stones fell to the street below that paved area with the, with the, uh, uh, the stone blocks. That's street level during Jesus' day. And those stones have gone untouched since 70 AD as a reminder of this horrible day. All because they did not recognize the time of God's coming to them. I'm going to share five quick points about Palm Sunday present. That's Palm Sunday past. Let's translate this into five quick points, Palm Sunday present. The first is God uses people for his kingdom, sometimes to go, sometimes to give, sometimes both. The disciples went, the owners of the donkey gave, sometimes we do both, but God employs people for his kingdom's work. Number two, Jesus Messiah is always worthy of our worship. When Jesus didn't live up to their idea of what Messiah was, the hero's welcome turned into a mob scene. Jesus may not always deliver according to our expectations, but that only means that he has far better plans for us than we can possibly imagine. So worship him, even when life disappoints because God always has something better in store for us, and he's worthy of our worship. Number three, there will always be critics, skeptics, and hypocrites in the crowd. Never let that deter your faith. There are Pharisees in every church, in every town, in every crowd. Don't let them define your relationship with Christ or deter you from following him. You are accountable for you. Number four, God still weeps over lost souls. So should we. Charles Spurgeon once said, quote, winners of souls must first be weepers of souls. You will not really be able to win people to Christ if you don't first weep for them in their lost condition. We must develop the same heart that God has for people if we ever expect to be used by God to bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ. God says in Ezekiel 33, 11, that he does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says that God wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. May God give us his heart for the lost in our world. Finally, number five, don't miss the time of God's coming to you. Most of the people of Jesus' day missed him, and he was standing right in front of them. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. When you believe, then you see. And then, finally, Palm Sunday future. Did you know that the Bible actually tells us that we're going to have a do-over? We're going to be able to get this right? In the book of Revelation, it It speaks of a time around the throne of heaven when we're worshiping God and we're worshiping the Lamb, which is Jesus. I'll put the verse on the screen for you. It's Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. John writes, After this I looked, and there before me, he's looking prophetically, he's seeing into the future, he's seeing heaven. He says, And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. 
They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. One day, there's going to be a Palm Sunday done right where everybody's rejoicing, nobody's rejecting, nobody is weeping. We're all celebrating Jesus and worshiping around the Lamb. And I look forward to celebrating that day with you. <laughs> Next week is the rest of the story as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So let's first pray. And then remember also this Wednesday night, we have a Passover teaching. We share communion together. So don't miss Wednesday night either as we talk about the crucifixion and then next weekend, the wonderful resurrection of our Savior. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you desire to save us because of your love for us so much that you would give your son Jesus to come to die. And we think about the people who saw him and yet rejected him. He came among his own, but his own received him not. We pray, Lord, that we would not be numbered among the crowd that would miss the time of God's coming to us, but that instead, Lord, with hearts that are receptive, we would open our hearts to you to receive you, to believe in you, to trust you by faith, that we might experience peace with God, that you have provided for us through your atoning sacrifice on the cross. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to make us mindful of these things this week, especially leading up to the celebration of your resurrection. We love you and we thank you that you first loved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.